Today we're out here in the Drizzly Forest taking a look at the latest version of Nissan's all-time best-selling vehicle in America, the Nissan Sentra. For 2020, they've given this a complete clean sheet redesign. Even though the compact sedan segment in America is shrinking and a number of American car companies have left this segment recently, the Korean and Japanese car companies are really doubling down and giving us a ton of new models. We have an all-new Corolla launch last year, also a new Kia Forte. We have a new Elantra coming up this year, and of course, the all-new Mazda 3 that we recently drove as well. And into that new world comes this all-new Sentra. When it comes to exterior design, I think Nissan has been going in a really good direction with a lot of their sedans. Let me know what you think about this look down there in the comment section below. I think this looks more aggressive and more exciting than something like the Toyota Corolla for 2020 and more cohesive with the rest of the lineup than the Honda Civic. I also think that in terms of overall proportions, this comes across a little bit better, especially as we're gonna take a look around the side and the rear than something like the Kia Forte. The Forte is sort of wearing Kia Stinger clothes, but it fits a little bit loosely on that overall smaller body. We're driving the top end SR trim, so we have full LED headlamps right here. We also have a standard radar sensor behind that big Nissan logo and this U-shaped chrome bar that we see in just about every other Nissan in America. The fog lights down here are also LEDs, which I do think is a nice touch. In a lot of inexpensive vehicles in America, with LED headlights, the fog lights become incandescent. That's because when it comes to active safety, Nissan has gone in a slightly different direction than Toyota or Honda. And I think that this was the right choice for the Sentra. And I hope that this set of active safety features makes its way standard into every Nissan model in America. In addition to the rear parking sensors, we also have rear auto brake, a very handy feature in my opinion, something that has definitely saved me in my personal life. I have a Dodge Durango with that feature on it and it's kept me from hitting pots in my driveway. This vehicle also has a standard radar sensor up front, but we don't have radar adaptive cruise control standard like we find in the Honda and Toyota options. Instead, it's there to enable the pedestrian detection and help out with the collision autonomous braking. Also in kind of an unusual twist, we have lane departure warning, but not lane departure prevention. But on the other hand, we have standard blind spot monitoring with rear cross traffic detection, something that is generally optional in most new cars in America. When it comes to overall length, all the compact stands in America are pretty close together. This is almost exactly the same length as the Corolla, the Forte, and the Civic at 182.7 inches long. This model does have a floating roof design, which is what Nissan calls this particular treatment right here. It's a little less obvious if you get the black roof in the Sentra, which I think is definitely my preference for this model. I've never cared for this particular look right here. It's definitely a styling choice. Let me know what you think about that down there below. But again, if you're looking to hide it in the Sentra, then you can get the black roof option and it does hide that pretty well. We don't find quite as much styling going on on the side. It is a little bit more slab sided than we find something like a Nissan Altima or Maxima, but we do have some extra style back here with these sharp creases and up front there as well. In terms of overall side styling, I think the Mazda 3 comes across as the most attractive in this segment. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. But I think I like this look overall better than the Forte, the Corolla, or the Civic. Bearing in mind, we are driving the top end trim. We also have some premium touches like the LED turn signal indicators on the mirrors. Moving to the rear, we find incandescent tail lamp modules. That has surprised some, but remember the center is a lot less expensive than a number of the competition, so I'm not too surprised overall by that. We do have a lip spoiler right here on the trunk. We are driving the SR trim, and then we have a single exhaust tip over here on the driver's side. A surprising touch back here is that we do have standard parking sensors in the rear. At least for the moment, there's just gonna be one engine under here. It's a two liter, four cylinder direct injection engine that produces 149 horsepower and 146 pound feet of torque. Nissan has not said whether they expect the turbocharged engine to return or if we should expect a hybrid in the future. There's also just one transmission on offer as well. It's a continuously variable transmission, basically the same one that we found in the last generation Sentra that gets this 32 miles per gallon combined. That is a little bit below some of the competition and the overall power figure is a little bit closer to the Corolla than the Honda Civic. Don't worry, our detailed pricing and comparison section is yet to come in this video, but I think up front it's important to remember that the Sentra is gonna be notably less expensive than the competition. This is at least $1,000 less expensive than something like a Honda Civic. We get more standard equipment on this model in the base trim, and there's gonna be more cash on the hood as well. At the moment right now, there's at least $1,000 off if you visit your local Nissan dealer, and we don't see that same kind of discount on something like the Honda Civic or Toyota Corolla. So as you're watching this video and you're taking a look at the inside, the outside, under the hood, et cetera, keep in mind, this is going to be about five to 10% less expensive at the very start than most of the competition, and you may be getting an even better deal on the Nissan lot. When it comes to front seat comfort, I give the Sentra 9 out of 10 points. For my body shape, these seats are very comfortable, but keep in mind that these seats are not as adjustable as some of the competition. 
The seat bottom cushion, for instance, is adjustable only for height and the rear of the seat lifts more than the front. You cannot adjust the rake of the seat bottom cushion. We do have a two-way power lumbar support here, however, and a steering column with a large range of motion. Now, even in this top end trim, the passenger seat remains a manual design. Hopping into the rear, we find a little bit less legroom than we found in the previous generation Sentra, something that we also saw when the Toyota Corolla was redesigned. However, sitting right here behind myself, I still have about three inches of legroom left. I think the bigger loss in the Sentra is the headroom. My head is just barely touching the ceiling and the Sentra had long had one of the roomier back seats in this segment. Now keep in mind, this is still a compact stand, so the overall rear seat bench is not gonna be as wide as something like an Altima. But because legroom is relatively generous and really not that far off the average midsize sedan, I can actually sit right here behind this front seat with it all the way back in its tracks. So the Sentra is the kind of vehicle that you could comfortably have four adults in, but you are gonna find a little bit more room in something like the Jetta. Behind the trunk lid, we find just over 14 cubic feet of storage space, putting this right in the middle of things for the compact sedan segment. One thing that I've really loved about Nissan sedans for years is their ability to accommodate 22 inch roller bags in this upright position and still close the trunk lid. That makes them an awful lot more cargo practical than some of the competition. The problem is that no longer works for 2020. Due to this all new platform design, the trunk has become a little bit longer in terms of overall dimension and a little bit shallower. And that means that you just can't have this bag in this position and still close the trunk lid. It just doesn't work. On the other hand, there's still plenty of room in here to put 22 inch roller bags in this position and still slide them all the way back there to the rear seat backs. And then you could put some additional luggage right there behind it. But again, overall, not quite as practical as the previous generation model. In case you're wondering, yes, there is a spare tire under the load floor. It's one of the donut variety. You can see that they store the scissor jack right there next to it. As we look around this interior, keep in mind that we are in the top end SR trim. So we have a moonroof right here over the driver and front passenger's heads. The driver and front passenger get height adjustable shoulder belts, two-way adjustable headrests, and you can see that we have orange contrasting stitching on the seats. The shoulder section of the seat has a fabric insert to help dress things up a little bit. And again, you can see more of that stitching going on right there. As we move on over to the seat side cushion and seat back cushion, you can see that the bolstering is not terribly aggressive there. Moving over to the front doors, we find a reasonable percentage of soft touch materials. We do have a soft touch upper section right there on the door, this extra stitching going on right there in the soft middle, and then a very soft armrest like we find in other Nissan products. This particular model has the optional Bose audio system, so we do find a Bose logo on that speaker grill right there, right next to that storage bin at the bottom. Moving over to the dashboard, we find a soft touch injection molded upper section here with after stitching. So this is a traditional injection molded part that's then been run over to give it this orange stitching. As you'd expect out of a compact stand, hard plastics are definitely found lower in the dashboard. And then we have a bin style glove compartment right here. I was able to fit a large tablet computer inside without a problem. Moving over to the middle of the dashboard, we find one of two different infotainment systems depending on the trim level you get. Base models get a seven inch touchscreen system, which still has Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, something that is optional in the base Civic. The rest of the trim line will get this larger eight inch color touchscreen. We have some physical buttons along the bottom, direct access to the 360 degree camera system. Pretty unique feature in this particular segment. Direct access to the home menu, which takes us back to the systems interface. Then there's a single button press right over here on this side to get over to Apple CarPlay. There's also a physical volume knob and a physical tune and scroll knob. Overall, the system is pretty easy to use. I don't find the software quite as intuitive as we find in the Kia Forte or the Hyundai Elantra, but I think the system is definitely more modern and a lot fresher feeling than what we find in the Honda Civic. This system uses the same basic software package that we find in a number of Nissan products, so we still have Nissan's connected services, for instance, right there. Below the infotainment system, we find three pretty large air vents. There's a knob right in the middle to open and close the vent. It's a pretty easy to use design right there. We find dual zone automatic climate control below that and controls for the heated seats and the heated steering wheel right there. A USB-C and regular USB input for the infotainment system. Right now I have my iPhone connected via the USB-C port and that does work with the CarPlay or Android Auto interface. We have a pretty typical console shifter right here drive all the way back there, this low one more click. And then this little button right there on the back of the shifter is the sport mode button. It's pretty discreet. Some folks miss that. We have a start stop button right there for the keyless go system, a small storage cubby and two very, very large cup holders. The center console has more of that contrasting stitching going on. It is softly padded. And if we open this up, we find a reasonable amount of storage space for a compact stand. One thing that I do appreciate in most modern Nissans is that the armrests are all very softly padded. It's a really nice touch. 
On the driver's side, we have a partial LCD instrument cluster, but in kind of a surprising move, this is not shared with the Versa and the Kix, but rather with Nissan's larger products in the US. So we still have a physical speedometer and tachometer on the left and the right, and then the color display is right there in the middle. It is a seven inch display, basically like we find in the Nissan Pathfinder. In this display, you'll find things like fuel economy, your regular trip information, status of the vehicle's active safety systems, readouts from the infotainment system, and the ability to change certain vehicle settings. Moving out from there, we have an attractive flat bottom steering wheel. It's heated and leather wrapped in this model. We also have sport grips right up top. And I have to say the steering wheel design overall is one of my favorites in the mainstream segment. On the right side of the steering wheel, we have the controls for the radar adaptive cruise control. We also have a voice command button and a phone button, but we don't find any lane keeping assistance button or pro pilot assist button because those are not features available on the Sentra. On the left side, we have the infotainment controls and then this joystick arrangement controls that multifunction LCD cluster. Acceleration times in the Sentra will really depend on exactly how you started the Sentra off from a complete stop. If you were not at a full stop, if you didn't just go straight to a full throttle acceleration, then this will imitate gear shifts as you just heard there. If however, you go, do go to a complete stop here, we're gonna just come to an absolute full stop and then just romp on the accelerator immediately, then the CVT will just behave like a CVT and will just vary ratios. It won't do the imitation shifts that we saw before. You can see you're just hanging out there right around 5,500, 5,600 RPM as we start accelerating. That's gonna give you eight seconds zero to 60, which is pretty average as far as a compact sedan goes. Remember that the vast majority of the competition at this point has a CVT under the hood. We find a CVT in the new Elantra, the Kia Forte, the Toyota Corolla, the Honda Civic, etc. Really the only entry in this segment that is not gonna have a CVT in any of the trims is gonna be the Mazda 3. But the Mazda 3 is not necessarily gonna be that much faster because it does have an older six-speed automatic transmission and the Mazda 3 is overall fairly heavy. In our braking test, it took 115 feet to stop this vehicle from 60 miles an hour back to zero. That's because Nissan really kept weight in check with this generation of the Sentra. And the relatively light curb weight pays dividends when it comes to overall handling. I'm gonna give this an A when it comes to the overall handling score. Unless you're talking about the sportier trims of the Honda Civic, which obviously don't have a direct corollary over here in the Nissan lineup, the Sentra is gonna be one of the better handling options in this segment. I like the overall handling feel of this better than what we see in comparably equipped and comparably priced versions of the Civic, or of course the Toyota Corolla as well. Now, if you are willing to spend a little bit more, obviously you can get Civics that will handle better. We have a sport trim of the Civic, we have the Civic Si, we have the Type R, etc. but none of those models has a direct competitor here in the Nissan lineup. This is really only competing with perhaps the bottom two entries in the Civic. The lack of sport trims is really important to keep in mind because while you can have more fun in a Forte or an Elantra or a Civic, etc., they're not gonna be quite the same thing as the model that we're driving right here. Out on a rougher gravel road like we're on here, the Sentra has a pretty decent balance in terms of the overall suspension tuning. The SR trim that we're driving here does have lower profile tires than the base models, so this one falls a little bit below that in terms of overall ride score. I'm gonna give this an A minus. Bear in mind that sport trims of the competition, like the Civic or the Elantra, are going to be, generally speaking, a little bit firmer than this. They think that the Toyota Corolla comes in just a little bit softer. In our cabin noise score, the Sentra was pretty quiet in here overall. I'm gonna go ahead and give this a B plus when it comes to the cabin noise score. At 50 miles an hour, we got 72 decibels in here. But like many compact stands in America, if you're driving this out on a rougher road, you'll definitely notice that there's more cabin noise coming in from the tires. So wind noise is very well controlled, but road noise could be a little bit improved. When it comes to fuel economy, we've been averaging 30 miles per gallon, which is a little bit below the EPA score. If you want the best mileage in a vehicle in this segment, then you're gonna to wanna to be looking at hybrid options, something like the Honda Insight, the Hyundai Ioniq, or of course the Toyota Corolla hybrid. There was a time where Nissan really was giving us the best fuel economy in every segment that they were playing in, thanks to the CVTs that we find under the hood. But now that a lot of the competition have moved to continuously variable transmissions, some of the benefit in terms of overall fuel economy has fallen away for vehicles like the Sentra, because we do find better fuel economy in the Honda Civic with its 1.5 liter turbo and CVT. We also get better fuel economy in the Toyota Corolla with its standard CVT as as well. This is relatively similar to what we see in the Forte and relatively similar to what I expect in the upcoming new Elantra as well. On the other hand, if you want better fuel economy, just about everybody out there has a full hybrid option and manufacturers like Toyota and Hyundai actually have several options that are hybrids to compete directly with this. Hyundai has the Ioniq and the upcoming hybrid Elantra. Toyota has the Prius, of course, and the Toyota Corolla 
as well. Overall, out on the road, this is certainly a lot more competitive than the previous generations of the Sentra. This feels much more grown up out on the road. It feels a little bit sportier as well. I think the ride is a good balance between performance and a decent ride score there, but it is definitely a little bit firmer than the previous model. And overall, this Sentra just feels more substantial than the previous generation as well. And remember again that this is going to be less expensive than the competition. So let's talk about that now. The big thing to remember about the Sentra is that it is a very inexpensive option in this segment. It starts just over $19,000 and has a ton of active safety technology on it, like we mentioned earlier. We have the autonomous emergency braking system with pedestrian detection, a feature that we don't find on most base AEB systems out there. We also have blind spot monitoring with rear cross traffic detection, the rear parking sensors with reverse emergency braking, auto high beams, and a ton of value features as well. The CVT is standard, as is a 7-inch touchscreen, not a 5-inch or smaller screen like we find in many of the competitors. Although it is worth noting, you don't get Apple CarPlay or Android Auto until the SV trim, which has a slightly larger display. That SV trim is probably the best deal in the center lineup, because for just about $1,000 more, we get a ton of additional equipment. We get things like the alloy wheels, the proximity key system, the six-speaker audio system, that 8-inch touchscreen I mentioned earlier with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. We also get XM satellite radio, the 7-inch LCD, LCD partial instrument cluster, two zone automatic climate control, and the adaptive cruise control functionality with that radar sensor in the bumper. Now, unfortunately, the SR trim, which is the one that we were driving today, does not have any extra power. And I think that's the one thing that's missing from the central lineup. But as you'll notice, when we take a look at some of the competitors here, that's not really going to matter so much because even though the SR is the top end trim of the Sentra, it comes in considerably less than most of the competition's mainstream trims. And remember that in typical Nissan fashion, there are a ton of discounts available on the Nissan lot as well. It looks like at this moment, you could expect between $750 and $1,000 off of the Nissan Sentra. That's a much deeper discount than we find on most of the other lots out there. So be sure and factor that in when we're talking about pricing and comparisons. With that out of the way, let's dive into the Civic as our first competitor. It starts at $20,650, so that's notably more expensive than the base Sentra. We also don't get the same kind of feature content in that base Honda Civic. In fact, that base Honda Civic is going to be more expensive than the mid-level SV trim of the Sentra, and it still won't have all the same kind of feature content we find in the SV. We won't get Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, alloy wheels, parking sensors, blind spot monitoring, the reverse emergency braking, and we get Honda's older 5-inch infotainment system. On the other hand, if you're willing to pay for the features, you will find more stuff in the Honda Civic available. For instance, the EX trim and above have Honda's excellent 1.5 liter turbocharged engine that makes that one of the faster entries in this particular segment. It also improves fuel economy, interestingly enough, bumping the Civic from 33 miles per gallon up to 36. You also get 174 horsepower, making it one of the faster entries in this segment. We're not even talking about vehicles like the Civic Si or the Civic Type R yet. But the most important thing to remember here is that the most expensive version of the Nissan Sentra is not going to be as expensive as that Honda Civic EX, really. Next up, we have the Toyota Corolla, which starts at $19,600. With this generation of the Corolla, they have been very, very aggressive at driving a lot of their active safety technologies down even into the base model. And honestly, when we take a look at the level of feature content that we find in the Corolla, it offers excellent value even in that base model as well. But very much like the Honda Civic, the Sentra is still going to be less expensive than the Toyota Corolla. And the overall driving nature is not really going to be too much different. Toyota's newest continuously variable transmission in the Corolla is a little bit more engaging than what we find in the Sentra. It has a physical first gear to have give us a better launch, but honestly, for the most part, the transmissions are going to feel very, very similar. It's also worth noting that even though we have that physical first gear in the Corolla's transmission, it doesn't really give it much larger of a ratio spread than what we find in the Nissan Sentra. So overall fuel economy, overall performance is actually going to be fairly similar. The Corolla doesn't really get a whole lot of power in its base engine. Although the Corolla is also a brand new model, and keeping in mind that reliability predictions are a little bit like looking into a crystal ball, the Corolla is probably going to be more reliable overall than the Nissan Sentra, even though it also uses a continuously variable transmission. But on the other hand, the Sentra is going to be a little bit less expensive. I think it's more comfortable on the inside. I also think it's more attractive on the outside and on the inside. I really like the handsome styling, and I think the proportions of the Sentra are most important here as well. When we take a look at the overall profile of a lot of vehicles in this segment, they get the same sort of family styling that we see in the mainstream sedan in their lineup, just sort of shrunken down for 
the compact sedan, and that doesn't always work as well as you might think. I think the biggest victim of that is the Kia Forte, which we'll talk about here in a bit. They decided to style the Forte very much like the Kia Stinger, but when they shrank that overall styling down into the compact format of the Forte, it doesn't come across quite as attractive as the Stinger. So I think overall the Sentra did a better job with shrinking the Altima styling. And with that segue, let's dive right into the Kia Forte, because this has one of the strongest value propositions in this segment, and it compares very well with the Nissan Sentra. The Forte starts less expensive at just under $18,000, but you get a manual transmission, not an automatic transmission, which is standard on the Sentra, and we don't have all the same kinds of active safety technology there either. But on the other hand, Kia gives us a long standard warranty, including a very long powertrain warranty. So if you're worried about how long your CVT or your engine is going to last, then the Kia Forte is going to be a good option for you because adding a 100,000 mile powertrain warranty to something like a Nissan Sentra could cost you $1,000 at the dealer, and that would mean that the Forte with that standard long warranty is going to be less expensive overall. Again, I don't think the Forte is quite as attractive as the Sentra. I do like the overall look, but I think the Sentra wears its design a little bit better. But on the inside, the Forte has an attractive interior and it's pretty comfortable as well. It's also well equipped. Option for option, the Nissan and the Kia are pretty close, until you start getting up towards the top. And for the price tag of the SR trim that we were driving this week with the Sentra, you could get the 1.6 liter turbocharged engine in the Forte GT. And I think that is the one problem with the top end trim of the Sentra. I think in the SV trim and the S trim, it performs very, very well in terms of overall value. But by the time you get up into the SR trim, you could get something like the Kia Forte with over 200 horsepower and a dual clutch automatic transmission for about the same price. And that is unquestionably going to be more fun. But for that particular model, you're not going to get the same kind of discounts we find on the Nissan lot, and I suspect that the Nissan SR is still going to be a little bit less expensive. I also think it's still just a little bit more handsome as well. Next up, we have the Volkswagen Jetta. The Jetta is bigger on the outside, but interestingly enough, it's not actually bigger on the inside, with the exception of rear seat headroom. So if you have a lot of tall people in the back of your compact stand, the Jetta may be a little bit more comfortable, but I think for most folks out there, the two models are going to be very, very similar. With this generation of Jetta, Volkswagen has very clearly been focusing on value. Previous generations of Nissan mainstream products were trying to be discount luxury vehicles, but they really have given up on that with the new Passat and the new Jetta. So this is really focusing very strongly on the shopper that's out there looking at something like the Forte or the Elantra or the Sentra, the definite value entries in this segment. We get standard LED headlamps, we get a standard 1.4 liter turbocharged engine, there's a manual transmission if you want one, or a traditional automatic as well. So if you're looking at escaping continuously variable transmissions in this particular segment, you don't really have too many options. There are a few very limited numbers of manual options out there, and then we have entries like the Mazda 3 or the Volkswagen Jetta that have traditional automatics. This new focus on value is part of why the Jetta has such a low starting price tag. It goes under $19,000 for the base model. But when you start scratching the surface, you'll notice that we don't have the same kind of active safety technology and we don't have an automatic transmission in that base model. As you start adding options to the Jetta, you'll notice that the price tag ends up very similar to the mid-level and top-end trims of vehicles like the Honda Civic and the Toyota Corolla. So it will definitely get much more expensive than the Nissan as well. Although we do find features in the Jetta that we don't find in any other compact sedan in this category category, like a full LCD instrument cluster, which is absolutely gorgeous. So if that's something that you're interested in, you'll find that in the Jetta. You won't really find that in the other options. If on the other hand, you're looking for more Germanic style handling, you'll find that in the Honda Civic, not necessarily the Volkswagen Jetta anymore. Choosing a winner in this segment is pretty difficult because honestly, there are a ton of really attractive and competitive options here. The Honda Civic has excellent handling, but it is a little spendy and the styling is a little bit quirky as well. Also keep in mind, the base trims are not terribly well equipped compared to the newer entries in this segment. We then have the Nissan Sentra, which is unquestionably the value leader. I also think it's probably the attractiveness leader. It is very comfortable as well. The Kia Forte has strong value with optional performance for about the same price as the top end trims. But again, I think that the Nissan Sentra SR ends up being a little bit more attractive, especially in the two-tone color combinations that we were driving. Then of course we have the Volkswagen Jetta, which is a solid value alternative as well, especially if you're looking for something with a little bit more rear seat room. So if my own money were on the line, what would my top pick be? Well, that really depends on what my budget is. If I was looking at something that needed to be under $20,000, or actually I would say under about $22,000, then I would get the Nissan Sentra, I think, in this segment, unless I could stretch myself into a, perhaps a hybrid model like the Hyundai Ioniq. 
but if I was willing to spend a little bit more, then I would get the 1.5 liter turbocharged Honda Civic. But bear in mind, that's gonna be about 20% more expensive than a comparably equipped Nissan Sentra. That's the tricky thing here. Is the Honda Civic more fun? Yes, it is. Does it handle better? Yes. Does it accelerate better? Yes but it's going to be notably more expensive. And that Delta, is that worth it? That's really up to you. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. But I have to say for under $22,000, the Nissan Sentra is certainly my top pick in the segment. And I would definitely get it over the Honda Civic at that price point, over the Toyota Corolla at that price point, and also over the Jetta and the Kia Forte. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. And let me know what your pick would be in this segment and how much you'd be willing to spend. Be sure and find us over at facebook.com slash alexnados to see what we're driving right now. You can also find us over at Instagram to see the lighter side of Alex Nados, and I will see you all next week.